All right, so a quick review. So you can pull your notes out from last week or whatever. I, I know y'all memorized all of last week's anyway. <laughs> okay, so who was the son of Rehoboam in Judah? Who's the son? Abijah. Abijah, correct. And Abijah is going to reign for three years. Abijah, his great military conquest. Remember what that was? Abijah's great military conquest. He defeats Jeroboam. That's a major thing right there. Okay, let's see. His, uh, his marital statistics. This was um, an outstanding in a negative way. <laughs> his marital statistics. He had 14 wives and 38 children. So that was uh, noteworthy, not for good, but for bad. <laughs> okay, the third king of Judah. Remember who that is? Asa. Asa. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be a long-reigning king. He reigns for 41 years. The big event that happens in the second year of Asa's reign. You know what that is? The big event that happens. No, well, he does do that. He does that twice, um, and I'm not sure what years he's doing that, but those are two things that do happen. This big event is not necessarily tied to him. The big event is Jer uh, Jeroboam dies. Jeroboam, who's been ruling through three kings of the south, had finally dies. So there's new blood in the other kingdom. Uh, the second king of Israel, the northern tribes. Anybody know who that is? Nadab. Nadab. And he is the son of Jeroboam. Um, in the north, you have to keep track of who's the son and who's the father because there is no royal line. In the south, it's easy because they follow the royal line. It's always a son of going straight down. Uh, okay, how does he die? How does Nadab die? Basha kills him, conspires against him, and kills him. All right, so that catches us up with the review from last week, and now we'll start something new. Asa, we're back to Asa. In the 15th year of Asa, he makes a second reform. He starts cleaning things up again. This is good. And you have to do that periodically through your life. You might get things straightened up and think you're doing well, and just time as time goes, things happen. <laughs> Flesh happens. <laughs> You've got to periodically go do a checkup. Go to the Bible, say, okay, what needs cleaning out? What needs re reforming? And you'll have to be doing that your whole life. Well, here he's doing it with the kingdom. In 1 Kings 15, verse 12, 1 Kings 15, 12. 1 Kings, 12. First, uh, 1 Kings 15, verse 12. Yeah, 12 would have looked a little odd, wouldn't it? This is the second time he's taken the stone out of my That's right. That's right. 1 Kings 15, 12. And he took away the sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols his father made. You see, these, the Sodomites and the idols are a continual thing they're having to fight. Israel fights these their whole existence, as does America, or should. We've given up the fight. Um, that's 1 Kings 15, verse 12 to 15. Now you'll see it again in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 8. 2 Chronicles 15, verse 8, and the, the whole passage is 8 through 19. We'll just pick out a couple of things. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of, Judah, out of the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities, so forth, so on. So that tells us something else. You need to hear preaching. He heard a prophet come in and say, Hey, I've got a prophecy for you. 
He was already motivated to do right, so why does he need a prophet? Everybody needs one, <laughs> because this flesh is flesh. Now, especially in the Old Testament, there's no indwelling Holy Spirit. So, if we've got problems, you know they had some problems. <laughs> we really don't have an excuse, because we have the Holy Spirit in us. Verse 9. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, and they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. The people who wanted to do right took note of somebody who was actually doing it. And they said, hey, I'll, I'll get in charge. That guy's in, let's let him be in charge of us. He knows what he's doing. Verse 10. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. This is when it happens. He's, this is a high point in his reign. Verse 13. And whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death. Wow. He was so serious about it, he said, In fact, if you're not going to follow God, you don't even need to be in my kingdom. That's a stand right there. Um, I'm not saying we should kill people now, but in your life you should feel the same way. In your life, if anything you participate in is not going to follow God, you should kill it. Dead. Verse 15. Do what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Verse 15, And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their hearts and sought, with him, uh, and sought him with their whole desires. And he was found to them. And the Lord gave them rest round about. That was a blessing. They didn't do it in order to get rest. They were just doing right because it was the right thing to do. And God does give blessings. Blessings are, are just natural. They're in the path that's going the right way. It's just what happens when you're heading in the right direction. But if you start seeking the blessings that are on that path without getting on the path, you don't get them. Um, and that's what a lot of people do, is they want God to give them this blessing and this blessing, you know, the temper tantrum that the charismatics throw. God, you do this, and I, I declare and decree this and this. Well, those are blessings that you're wanting that are natural for a child of God to get if you're living right and walking in the right ways he told you to. But once you start focusing on the blessing, he does just what he says in Malachi chapter 2, I'll curse your blessing. Okay? If you're looking at the blessing instead of the God who produces them, then he's going to curse it so you see that blessing is not the God you thought it was. So that's where we are here. Um, verse 19. And there was no more war until the 5 and 13, uh, 30th year of the reign of Asa. So they had rest for a good long while. Um, up north in the northern kingdom, um, there's an issue. Asa and Basha, I'll say that too fast, Asa and Basha, <laughs> go to war. Twenty years after the second reform, the one we just read about, there's a war between the south and the north. Remember, they'd been given rest. Rest is good, but rest is not your calling. <laughs> your calling is a soldier. You're in a war. Now, if God gives you rest, that's good. You're to recoup from it. You're to stock up. You're to strengthen up. Um, but there's a war coming. God intends battle. He intends a battle, and battle is so ingrained in the Christian life that he ends everything with Armageddon. And then that doesn't really end it. He says, I'm going to give you a blessing. It's going to be the millennium. That's going to be a Sabbath rest, 1,000 years on the 7,000-year increment of the earth. After that, he ends that with a war, Gog and Magog. <laughs> so war is inevitable, even if, he, even if you're doing right. That'll be 1 Kings 15, verse 16 to 22. 1 Kings 15, verse 16 to 22.
he says, And there was war between Asa and Basha, king of Israel, all their days. And Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramoth, that he, uh, that he might not suffer any to go out and come to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and delivered them unto the hand of his servant. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, I think I'm saying that right, the son of Hezron, the king of Syria that dwelt in Damascus, saying, There's a league between me and thee and between my father and thy father. Really? Behold, I have sent unto thee a present of silver and gold. Come and break thy league with Basha, king of Israel, that he may depart from, depart from me. So Ben-Hadad hearkened unto, the, unto King Asa, and sent the captains of the host, which he, had, uh, which he had against the cities of Israel, and smote Ijon, and Dan, and Abel Beth Maica, and Sinareth, with all the land of Naphtali. And it came to pass, when Basha heard thereof, that he left off building Ramah, and dwelt in Tirzah. And King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah, none was exempt, that they should take away the stones of Ramah, and the timber thereof, wherewith Basha had builded. And King Asa built them in Gibeah of Benjamin in Mitzvah. Wow, that's a bunch of names. <laughs> okay, so you see what's going on here. He's making leagues with other people. That's a scary proposition. Don't start getting involved with other nations. Israel, God said to Israel when they were first created, he said, you're going to lend to many nations, but you're not going to borrow. You're going to be over many nations, but they're not going to be over you. So the tricky thing is, well, nobody's really over anybody. I'm just getting a little help. But then I'm, why are you paying them silver and gold and all this other stuff? Okay, it's, it's tricky. It's a slippery slope. Once you start down it, it doesn't end well. So there's war between these two. Um, in Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7, Second Chronicles 16, verse 7. Hanani, the seer, rebukes Asa for his league with Syria and prophesies further warfare. You're going to have war. There's no way around it. When you start tying into the world to come help you fight your battle, it doesn't help. It means the war gets worse. <laughs> Second Chronicles 16, verse 7. And at that time... Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand uh, were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims and the, a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen yea because thou didst rely on the Lord he delivered, the, uh, he delivered them into thy hand he said we've been here before remember the last time you were outnumbered, you were surrounded, and you depended on the Lord, and he delivered. How come you're not depending on him now? You thought that was a one-trick pony? Can't happen again? No, God intends us to take miracles from the past and apply them to the present. Remember what he told the disciples? They were in the boat, and the boat's rocking back and forth, and um, they're all worried. And he said, hey, look, why are you so fearful? Don't you remember what happened when I had 5,000 people out there without any bread? How about the time we had 7,000 out there? How about the time we had 4,000 out there? He says, is your heart hardened? He said, they were supposed to apply a miracle of breaking bread to Jesus being able to calm a storm. Now, I would not have put those two together, but Jesus expected them to. Same thing here. He's the prophet showing up and saying, hey, look, God was your deliverer when you depended on him before, and now you've gone about to find another source for your deliverance. Why have you done that? Verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose hearts is perfect toward him. 
that's a good verse to know. He's looking for somebody that he can help. Because Jesus Christ is our what? Savior. Well, he wants to be the Savior. You need, a, you need saving? Has your life got problems it needs to be saved from? That's his job. He says, I'm looking. I'm looking for somebody I can save. And they've got to qualify, though. They've got to have a perfect heart. If they've got a perfect heart, I've got a perfect solution. But I'm not just coming down there to save anybody. Verse, uh, now I'm not talking about eternal salvation. I'm talking about day-to-day -day salvation. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from henceforth, thou shalt have wars. Okay, so war, this time the war is punishment. It's not just normal war. It's war that they could have avoided. Verse 10, Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house. For he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people uh, the same time. It, it's, it's sad to see this happen. Asa has done well for a good while. And then all of a sudden it just takes a little bit of corruption and a little bit of laying down on the job and a little bit of not fighting the, the enemy the way you should, and it all goes to pot quick. Here he is. Now he's mad at the man of God. Furthermore, he says he oppressed some of the people. He's going to start taking it out on the people. He says, look, I don't like God, and I don't like you people who are liking him. Um, Remember before he had said, if you're not for God, we're going to kill you. You can't be in my kingdom. Now he's mad at the prophet, the representative of God. And he says, I'm going to go a step farther, and I'm going to go against anybody who's buddies with him. <laughs> That's just human nature. All right, let's see what happens next. What happens next is in the northern kingdom, Basha. Basha begins to reign in uh, 24 years in Tirzah. Tirza is a new capital. Am I saying that right? Tirza, yeah. Tirza is a new capital in the north. First uh, Kings fifteen thirty three. First Kings fifteen thirty three. You probably don't recall it, but um, Jeroboam was in uh, uh, Shechem. I believe that's where he was. Somewhere. Starts with an S. Um, let's see if it's on my map over here. Would be just north of. No, this doesn't have enough things on it. Um, here's Tirza. This is where they're going to. Um, and where he was. Yeah, where he was was Shechem. It's right there. So he's moved north there. Um, I don't see where my legend is, but that's probably about 30 miles, 15, 30 miles north to Tirzah. Uh, verse 33, 1 Kings 15, 33. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Tirzah, 20 and 4 years. Tirzah becomes a royal residence instead of Shechem. S-H-E, I don't know if I'm saying it right. What is that? Oh. Um, S-H-E-C-H-E-M, Shechem. Tirzah is supposed to be a naturally beautiful place. Uh, and so because of that, it becomes attractive for the kings. You know, that's Martha's vineyard of, <laughs> of Israel for them. So they're going to go there and make that the headquarters because they're kings, so they must have the best. <laughs> now, now the kings take a lot of license. Now, I can understand it to a degree. God gave Jerusalem when it was all one nation. But now they've split up and there's no Jerusalem to flee to for the king to show that he's special. Okay, because there ain't nothing special up here. <laughs> so they find a plot of ground. They say, okay, this will be our equivalent of Jerusalem. And so they... Make tears of the new headquarters. In First uh, Kings fifteen, verse thirty-four, Basha does what ninety percent of these kings do, 
he does evil. <laughs> First Kings fifteen thirty four, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sins where wherein he made Israel to sin. So he follows suit with everybody in the north. He does evil. Evil is a uh, normal thing. I want to show you something on that word evil. Um, evil is a, a word you recognize. What's evil mean? Bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, satanic. Look at um, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Here's the first time evil shows up. And out of the ground uh, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So that's the first time evil shows up. And you know right off the bat, without having to consult any dictionary or any Greek or Hebrew lexicon, you know evil's bad. <laughs> now here's something. I've been reading a book by uh, Gail Ripplinger on um, the language of the Bible. And she pointed this out. This is good. The, the, the language of the Bible begins simple, and it continues through to get difficult. Here's the first time this word evil is used is right here at the beginning. If you started your Bible in Isaiah, let's go there. Isaiah 32, 6. If you started your Bible in the book of Isaiah instead of Genesis, You would not recognize the derivative of evil in here. Isaiah 32, 6. For the vile person will speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity, to practice hypocrisy, and to utter error against the Lord, to make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause, uh, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. See a difference in vocabulary? <laughs> I mean, we've gotten several 25-cent words in there now. Whereas in Genesis, it was simple. Knowledge of good and evil. It's easy. But you've got the word evil, that vil word. So now when you see villainy, it reminds you of evil. However, he worked his way up there, God did with the vocabulary. He didn't just jump right there. Go to Leviticus 17.7. 7. Yep. Leviticus 17.7. 7. Leviticus 17.7. 7. They shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. You see the evil in that word? Okay, you're used to it. You read it first in Genesis 2. So now to complicate the word a little bit, he adds one letter to it. Devil. So you recognize it as being bad. Then Deuteronomy 25.3. Deuteronomy 25, 3. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, forty wasn't many, <laughs> then thy brother should seem vile, like evil, vile unto thee. So all of that vocabulary begins to build, and it begins be begins in Genesis. And as you move through the Bible progressively, he starts adding and changing words so you get a bigger vocabulary. But it starts, your Bible starts at the beginning. In the beginning. Well, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> but most people, that's the first question they ask. Where do I start reading the Bible? 
Um, how about look at the outside cover? It'll say Holy Bible. That's a good place to start. Maybe you've got it on the spine. Start there. King James, you know. <laughs> Actually, there is a good place to start, and I don't know, most good Bibles have it. It'll be at the beginning of your, your Bible. You'll have um, the translators to the readers or the epistle dedicatory. That'll be in the very beginning of your Bible. Most good Bibles have it. Yours doesn't. <clears throat> No, that's the title page, but that's a good one. Um, uh-huh. There you go. That's the epistle dedicatory. And then um, the translators to the readers is a Cambridge thing, um, but it's about a 10 or 15 page thing from just the writers of the, the translators writing to King James saying, we've finished the work, here's what we did, and here's what we think of it and you. And it's good, very good. But yeah, you just start at the beginning. You start at the beginning and go through. So one of the first things you see in the beginning is evil. It's a contest. This life is a contest between good and evil. Always is. And if you are not very careful and always on your guard, evil becomes um, your leader before you know it. I mean, and you don't even have to set about to do anything wicked. Evil just takes over. It is so hard to keep it at bay. He says, be not conformed. That's not something you do actively. Conformed is something someone else does to you. Evil will take over. Be not conformed to this world, uh, but be you transformed. That's active. You do the transforming. Well, he does the transforming, but it's action on your part to do it. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's just that, that evil. You see it? Right here, how it all happens in the kingdom. It does the same thing that it's going to do in our lives. Um, we can go on a little farther. Look at uh, 1 Kings 16, 1. Jehu. Jehu's a character. Jehu prophesies against the house of Basha. 1 Kings 16, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hannah and I, uh, Hannah, Hannah and I, uh, uh, yeah, that, <laughs> against Basha, saying, For as much as I exalted thee out of the dust, you were nothing, you were in the dust, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the ways of Jeroboam, and hast made my people to sin, uh, made my people Israel to sin. Now you notice this is the northern kingdom, but God still, even though they're being wicked and they have been wicked now for uh, 20, uh, 21, 20, about 30 years, 30, 40 years, he's still saying they're his people. They're his tribes. That's his nation. Um, my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. Verse 3, Behold, I will take away the posterity of Basha. He says, Don't count on your son getting on the throne. I've not promised anybody in the north that they're going to be a dynasty from now till the Messiah shows up. That's promised in the south. You've made me mad, buddy. <laughs> your time is limited. Look at verse 4. Him that dieth of Basha in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that dieth of his, uh, of his in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. He, he says, um, this is going to be so bad that you're not going to have any descendants to sit on a throne. Furthermore, I'm going to make sure nobody could honor you because there won't be anything left of your bodies. Wow. I'd say they made him mad. <laughs> They did. And we get some closing remarks on his uh, on Basha's reign in sixteen verse first King sixteen verse six to seven. First King sixteen verse six to seven. So Basha slept with his fathers and was buried in Tirzah. He got to die in the capital. And Elah, his son, reigned in his stead. And also uh, by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hananiah, came the word of the Lord, so forth, so on. We already read that. Um, uh, let's see. I think I skipped something in that verse. Um, 
came the word of the Lord against Basha, against his house, even for all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, in provoking him to anger with the works of his hands. That's, he said it wasn't just attitudes. It was works of his hands. He physically did something God didn't like, as do we. Your hands, God's noticing. The things you physically do gets recorded. And God either likes it or he doesn't like it. If he doesn't like it, it doesn't hurt his feelings. It goes against the rules he set up, and nobody gets to overpower his rules. So the rule kicks in. Just like um, a governor. You know, a governor on a car, you can, I don't know if you've, you've mm -hmm. played with those before, but you'll be driving along, and you may have plenty of pedal, but the governor, il accelerate, Toby. Um. An accelerator in the car, so you can yeah not the governor not like not like the state's governor, <laughs> you can. Well, I'll explain it. If you're driving along, and you've got plenty of pedal, I'm at 95 miles an hour, and you know I've still got pedal. I can push it farther. You can push farther, but the car ain't gonna go any farther. And I've been in cars where the governor will kick it back at you. You can push the pedal even farther, and it'll pop it back. <laughs> right back at you that's what happens here when we go against god's rule it doesn't give him a bad day he doesn't care but it goes against his rule so the governor kicks in he's got to smack you it's just the way it is just like just like gravity you can say i don't believe in gravity and jump off the building as many times as you want it's not going to make god sad okay his law, well, it depends on how high the building is. <laughs> His law is still going to kick in, and you're going to come down. <laughs> Some people farther than others. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of his, his kingdom is prophesied there. So we've, had, we've got Asa in the south, Judah, and he's going to have this long reign. In the north, we had Basha. He came to power just two years after Asia. Now we've got Elah, Elah, E-L-A-H, who comes to power. He is the son of Basha. His son is going to reign, but we've already gotten a prophecy. It's not going to end well. Elah reigns for two years. <laughs> big, long, <laughs> big, big, long power there. Uh, that'll be in 1 Kings 16, verse 8. He says, in the twenty and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, son of Basha, to reign over Israel in Tirzah two years. Elah is killed. Elah, be, he has a little, um, a little problem. His underlings are not happy with him. It's important to make the people that answer to you like you. When you're the boss, and hopefully everybody in here one day will get to experience that joy. <laughs> when you're the boss, you have to crack the whip and make sure things happen, but you also need to make them like you. You should be, yeah. <laughs> honey, honey mixed with cayenne, yeah. <laughs> you have to, you should make them like you. That's one of the things that, um, What's her name? Um, um, Queen of Ethiopia or um, um, Queen of Sheba? I don't know where I'm getting these names. Queen of Sheba shows up to Solomon, and she says, "All of your servants are happy." She noted that. So for us, our underlings, the people that answer to us, they should be happy with us. Now you can't make everybody happy, and you should never go against what God says to make them happy. <laughs> that, that makes him unhappy, and he'll make you unhappy. <laughs> now that we've had our Barney moment. Here's what happens to him. 1 Kings 16, verse 9. Elah. And his servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Azar. Arza, 
steward of his house in Tirzah. Okay, so we see what's going on here. He's back in the, the beautiful city here, Tirzah. And he's doing what he shouldn't be doing, drinking himself drunk. Okay, uh, there's no other way to drink. You don't socially drink, you drink to get drunk. Else why are you doing it? I mean, nobody wants, they say they like the flavor of it. No, you don't like the flavor of it. Nobody likes the flavor of rotten. Nobody likes that. It's not an acquired taste. It's a degenerated taste. It's not something you start out liking. You've got to force your body to accept it because your body knows it's rotten. Okay, so he's doing this. He's drinking himself drunk in tears. Of. Well, now he's ripe for easy pickings. Verse 10. And, Zir, and Zimri went in and smote him and killed him. <laughs> Smoting him wasn't good enough. We've got to kill him too. Smote him and killed him. In the 20 and 7th year of Asa king of Judah, and reigned in his stead. Okay, here's how the king, here's how this dynasty changes hands. The servant comes in, kills the king, and sits down on the throne and says, I'm the new big man in town. Everybody's going to answer to me now. And that'll work for a little while. Uh, Zimri is going to have an exceedingly long reign. Seven days. <laughs> First <laughs> uh, King 16 verse 14 we get the closing remarks on Elah am I saying that right Elah I think that's, I think that's how you say it First King 16 14 now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel that's it we don't get a whole lot of information on him we do get the gory details he was bad God doesn't like him he got himself drunk his servant killed him, took over. Now, God didn't like the servant either. <laughs> just because he was able to conquer. Well, he was able to conquer because God was upset with the person that he was defeating. God will use an enemy to defeat another person and then turn around and destroy the enemy. <laughs> yeah, that's the way he does it. That's Zimri. I guess we'll pick up with Zimri next week and go from there.